Word Balloon is brought to you by the League of Word Balloon Listeners. Welcome back, everybody. Time again for Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here. Eve, I should have told you it's uh, less than 20 seconds, uh, the intro now, because people, smarter YouTube people told me, it's like, get to the content, man. You got to oh, the yeah. at the beginning. <laughs> no so, worries. I was just tending to something off camera here. I was like a sitcom where they go like, and starring. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or that or that great Simpsons when they're at the isotope game and you're seeing the broadcast and they're like, it's going, it's going. Our technical advisor is Joe Shumway. And he's sitting out there. Ibrahim Mustafa joins us today on Word Balloon. It's great to see you, Ibrahim. Welcome uh, back. Great to see you, John. Thank you so much for having me. And I would like to point out, uh, for those who don't know, uh, we are in the presence of a Hall of Famer, the Illinois State University uh, Broadcasting Hall of Fame. Mr. Yeah. John Santris. Thanks, Round of applause man. for this man. Uh, yes, sir. One of, the, one of the original podcasters. I don't know if people know that. Uh, John started this in 2005, was it? That's right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. podcasting was in its infancy. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people have, have taken their cue from this show, I'm sure, and started their own. And like I was telling John before we recorded, or before we went live, I've drawn countless comic pages to his show. So uh, I think, uh, you know, both for the uh, contribution to not only broadcasting, but the comics journalism uh, sphere, and then also just like sheer entertainment value. Uh, and I know a lot of other creators listen to your show too. So uh, uh, hearty congrats and well-deserved, my friend. Well, you're very kind, dude. Thank you. And it's... Yeah. Uh... Yeah, it was a great honor. It blew my mind. I was telling Abraham off the air. I, I now feel I know how the ball pair, players feel when they get the call because literally it was out of the blue. I'm good friends with the faculty advisor anyway. She's like, "How you been?" I'm like, "Good." She's like, "Uh, you coming to the uh, reunion this year?" I said, "Actually, yeah." I said, "It won't interfere with any radio work or anything." She's like, "Well, we're putting you in the Hall of Fame," and I'm like, "All right." <laughs> I guess I gotta go now. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. Literally, she's like, "Well, now you have to go," and I'm like, "Yeah, great." But it was terrific. A lot of my old uh, broadcast friends that are pros now, but also uh, just good college friends over the years. And I mean, my God, we're in our fifties, so it is kind of weird going to college. But thank God there was like a pack of us, so we didn't feel too weird around That's the cool. children. But uh, it was no, it was really great. And uh, yeah, thanks, man. Thanks for acknowledging it. And people have been so kind on social media uh praising and stuff so no it was a very it was a very very nice honor so thank you i may i yeah. may or may not do a podcast about like explaining well, really why as my sister said i called my sister and i'm like hey i'm going into the uh, illinois state university broadcast hall of fame she's like why <laughs> <laughs> well uh no, i think you should you, know. you should do one on it you know and maybe you can get somebody from the you know the board or something to come in and talk about it or you know it could be yeah, cool maybe. <laughs> But thanks, man. Well, anyway, enough about me. That's very kind, Eve. I, I really appreciate that. But let's uh, let's talk about uh, why you're here. Because as always, man, uh, you are come up with great uh, original graphic novels. Uh, of course, last year we spoke about Count. Yes, sir. Your, your sci-fi take on The Count of Monte Cristo. And uh, now a time travel adventure, retroactive. You got to deal with humanoids. Congratulations. The three Thank you. Uh, book deal. Is this the first book or is Count the first book? Counts the first, so this will be number two, and then I got one more coming. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. So, uh, give us the ten cent uh, tour on retroactive. Yeah. So the elevator pitch is essentially uh, James Bond meets Groundhog Day. Um, <clears throat> the longer version is that you know time travel exists. We're we're thirty years in the future or so, thirty forty years. Uh, oh, real quick, shout out to Pone Tony and to to Brad uh, in the in the chat right there. Thank you, gentlemen, for showing up. Um, yeah, so we're, you know, 30, 40 years in the future and uh, time travel exists, right? Um, but it's it's a clandestine thing. It's government organizations control it. And there's a Cold War brewing between sort of the five major superpowers. You know, it's very similar to like uh, current geopolitics, right? We have, you know, the US, Japan and, and the UK all have their own temporal agencies and their allies. And then you've got China and Russia doing their thing. And um, you know, essentially this technology exists and it, it's culminated in just like these cat and mouse games of, 
you know, Russia might go back in time to try to screw up our timeline for their benefit. And so this Bureau of Temporal Affairs exists as essentially like a CIA of time travel uh, to, to police the timeline and try to make sure that, you know, things happen as they're supposed to. Um, but then they'll also, you know, run some ops that are probably questionable. And, uh, they, um, you know, if there's like a, a terror attack or something, they'll, they'll go back and avert that. Right. Okay. Um, so that's the setup. And our main character, uh, who we see here on the cover, um, is investigating some anomalies in the timeline, uh, that sh are showing up essentially without like a, a corresponding signature. So they don't know who the, you know, if it was Japan, they would know. Right. But they can't tell who this is. And the uh, bad guys end up sticking him in a time loop. Uh, and so he has to, like, basically thwart a terror attack that is causing the data to restart over and over again and, and rejoin his own timeline so that he can try to save the day. Thank you, Brad. Uh, I'm very proud of it. And, you know, we had uh, another Brad, color it, Brad Simpson, and then Hassan Otamano, how uh, L lettered it. So we got the count team back together. And uh, yeah, I think I think we made something pretty cool. So hopefully people enjoy it. That's great, man. It's a it's a full story. I mean, it's like 130 pages or so. And it's, uh, you know, just 20 bucks for the graphic novel out of humanoids. Yeah. Uh, did you so um, did you talk to Wade about this? I mean, who who is your humanoids editor or, you know, person that you, you know, kind of, yeah. hey, do you guys like this idea? Who's who's your person? So uh, the way it worked out was there was an editor who used to work there who has since branched off to start his own uh, publishing imprint called fair square comics, a guy by the name of Fabrice Sapolsky. Uh, and actually, if you remember my, my uh, Nazi hunting spy story, Jaeger, I do. Uh, yeah. He's putting that out uh, through his imprint for the first time through diamond now. So that's kind of outstanding. Up. That's Thank great, you. man. You know, cause I was looking for a cover for Jaeger. I got a lot of your uh, previous works up there and I, and I didn't see, and I remembered it, but I'm like, I don't remember the name. And there you go. It's Jaeger. And yeah. Jaeger is fantastic. And uh, so that's good to hear that it's going to come yeah. out in print because that was and, a great digital comic. Thank you. And speaking of covers, we've got three covers now. We've got my original cover. And then we've got one from the man himself, Phil Hester. And then a, an incredible, uh, you know, very noir style cover from Dennis Calero. Oh, great. Uh, yeah. So I'm really excited about that. Um, and Phil also was kind enough to write the foreword for Retroactive and say very oh, wow. nice things about it so that was just like dream come true right there but uh anyway to answer your question <laughs> um uh so fabrice was initially the one who took my pitch for account and brought it to humanoids and mark at the time mark wade was i believe like an editorial consultant and he was a big uh champion of the book saying like you know you gotta you gotta sign this one and so once that was about to wrap up you know my editor at the time rob levin fantastic guy uh, who also edited Retroactive. Okay. Uh, he came to me and said, hey, you know, we'd like to stay in business with you. Do you have something else you'd want to throw our way, you know, for for consideration? And I was like, yeah. So I pitched them the idea for Retroactive um, and Mark liked it. And then as a response, basically said, okay, so we like this. We want to move forward with it. And also we'd like to, you know, loop it into a part of a three book deal. So count this and one more book. So that's kind of how that all happened. And then, so I actually just uh, sent in the script for my third book today, and you know that goes to to Mark, and then also uh, Rob has moved on to Valiant, and they hired Jake Thomas of you know Marvel X Men editorial fame uh, as the new senior editor at Humanoids. So now I get to work with another uh, luminary of the editorial uh, you know industry and in comics. So that's pretty cool too. So. Yeah, it gets it gets before a few people who uh, whose opinion I really care about, which is awesome. <laughs> That's excellent, man. And again, yeah. I've I've loved your spy work. I think you do a great job with espionage, whether it's Jaeger or now with uh, Retroactive. Your James Thank Bond you. work. I've got a I got a great uh, James Bond cover. Where the hell is it? I think right there. Boom. Yeah. Yeah, so. that was that was uh, my one shot Solstice that I got to write and draw, which was absolutely. Like dream project you know <laughs> certainly and then but you you know you also did james bond origins and you did mm -hmm. uh you know that uh you of course you sent me that amazing odd job uh was odd job for that story or was it for a different bond story? so with, with that one i actually i designed the character of odd job but then um i want to say it was mark laming and greg pock did the actual run so oh, i did the okay. character design okay okay yeah, yeah. 
because yeah, I, I love that man. It's one of my it's one of my favorite pieces that uh, an artist has ever given me and everything. It's oh oh yeah. the one yeah yeah that was um so okay I was confused I'm sorry I did a series of James Bond illustrations that were based on the movies and I, yeah I did I sent oh, you the Goldfinger one that's right yes yeah. yes yes that's right excuse me because yes you did both. And, I was thinking uh, of the comic, yeah. My no, <laughs> so it was, well, I was associating the, yeah. the odd job with the comic, but then, no, of course, that was your, yes, your series of, uh, like you said, homages to the films and everything. That's great. Um, and But again, your your great work with, uh, you worked with Parker, didn't you, on James Bond Origins? Yeah, yeah, that was a lot of fun. He, uh, you know, Jeff and I have a lot of, like, similar sensibilities, I think, and, and you know, he's a buddy and he's local, and so we got to... Yeah. We got to meet up at a coffee shop and, and you know, before, pre-pandemic, obviously, this was, you know, 2017, ah, yeah. 2018. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we, we both got these really weird, like, coffee root beer drinks that the place had. It was kind of gross. And we were drank them and we talked James Bond. <laughs> so, that's good. No, that's, I, you know, yeah. honestly, I want to get back. I came and I saw you uh, at that Rose City that I was yeah. at. Right before the pandemic, I think it was the last Rose City before the pandemic. Yeah, 2019. And uh, and truly, I, I do. I want to get back and on, on a non-conventional week so that I could see everybody and hang out a little bit more because I know everyone's yeah. busy. I was, I mean, I'm like, oh, this will be great. It's like everybody's busy with the con, dummy. And, yeah. uh, well, and you were working too, frankly, right? So yeah, kinda... I was just honestly just networking. I mean, yeah. I had every intention of doing a ton of interviews, and I even went to like Helioscope and. Went to uh, talk to that studio and everybody there, including Parker and um, and Steve Lieber and all mm -hmm. these people. But I was having just such a good time, and I really needed a vacation anyway. And I'm like, yeah. you know, I'm just gonna say hello and touch base and network the same the way that I do at most cons and just say hi. I don't want to do floor interviews anymore because you know everyone's busy signing books for people or meeting right. fans. And I'm like, hey, I'm already cutting the line with my press pass and talking to all of you as, as a friend and stuff. And it's like. You know, I don't want to be in your way, man. You know, you guys, yeah. you guys talk to the fans, and that's their connection time. So, no, but I will, I because well, good Lord, you know, it, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, like, there's like you 15 did. of you that I that I consider good friends that I love to see when I'm out there. Yeah. So. Well, and you didn't uh, totally get out of floor interviews that show because some some young podcasters recognized you at my table, and then you ended up giving an interview, which is cool. true. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's true. No, that's honestly that is like. And then the same thing with radio, and it happened at the Hall of Fame weekend. I mean, when people like recognize me, and and because really, again, man, I'm I'm that's really nice, and everyone's cool. But it, obviously, with the comic podcasters, they do know who I am, and uh, they do want to talk. So that's great, and it happens all the time. And I continue to get requests to be on other people's shows, and I'm happy to do it because you know, hey, it's a good chance to talk about our favorite shit, sit down, and uh, you know, yeah. just kind of chew the fat about uh, what we love to talk about. Definitely. So. I mean, good Lord, as you know, I mean, my 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 first uh, encounter with you was, of course, High Crimes, you and Chris Sabella. Yep. This excellent story and a great, I, I just love the, I've, from the moment I heard about it, I loved the concept. Thank and you. it was um, part of Monkey Brain, including uh, Chris Robertson, uh, you know, and uh, and his uh, fine imprint. I mean, it, you know, it was uh, it was a very cool digital initiative. Yeah. And, and I'm glad Alison that Baker. And Alison yep. Baker, indeed, of course. Yeah, um, that was our first uh like real book chris and i and that has kind of you know set a a, a pathway for us ever since which has been wonderful absolutely um, man. we actually so that's that was collected initially you know through dark horse in a hardcover and then uh eventually we got the rights from dark horse for print and now it's at image um and we just entered into the black i don't want to brag but uh you know <laughs> no <laughs> it's that's... finally it's finally turning a profit for us which is pretty cool that's so, great to hear, man. No, 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 know, absolutely. That's that's the thing, man. And and I mean, um, you're that example that I mean can stretch to Bendis and Rick Remender and other people like that, where it's like these first books kind of get you noticed. Mm -hmm. You don't make a profit on them and stuff, but eventually, because of your body of work, people come to these things. I I would assume that's what happened, and that it's likely yeah. your other your you know your post high crimes work that they reach back and go, well, he did this and I like what he does. Let me, let me see what this is all about. And again, it's a tight book from you and Chris. It's uh, it, it truly was. I mean, you guys were absolutely ready. And I, and that's what I appreciated about Allison and Chris uh, Robertson in terms of finding creators like you, Sabella and others that were, you know, ready to roll. And it's like, Hey, these are great new voices. These people need to be read. Thanks, man. Yeah. And you know, I was actually talking about this on Twitter today. Uh, because there was discussion of like comic review sites and and just reviews in general and and 
you know, people were positing, like, do they really help? Do they move the needle? Are they just, you know, there to regurgitate press release copy and stuff? And, and I think if you're talking big two, yeah, probably. But when it comes to books like this and, and creators who aren't on, you know, flagship uh, Marvel and DC titles, like, I think it's absolutely pivotal. I mean, the number of, of creators and books I found out from shows like yours and 11 o'clock comics and, you know, Swain and, and Dwight and Adrian back in the day on sidebar and stuff like, sure. um, you know, it makes a difference. And the reason we're in the black now on high crimes is largely because of digital sales. And everybody talks about what a drop in the bucket they are, but digital is how we broke in. You know, uh, we were nominated for two Eisners for that book. Yeah. Ja Jaeger was a digital first thing and I was nominated for an Eisner for that. So it's like, you know, our, our biggest sort of, uh, feathers in our cap came from digital stuff and, and, you know, so I, I don't like to discount it because I think, um, you know, it's, it's pivotal. I mean, a drop in the bucket to the larger publishers, sure. But when your bucket's a lot smaller, you know, you're, you're collecting those drops everywhere you can. So. Absolutely, man. You know, I'm, I'm going to grab a cover for Jaeger as you're answering Aishim's question here. Um, Aisham wants to know, uh, I'm wondering with the new print edition, are there new Jaeger stories on the horizon? Uh, that's a great question. Thank you, man. Um, you know, I, at one point, I actually, I remember this very vividly. The day I proposed to my wife, I had a, a, a really cool idea for a follow-up. And then I got so swept up <laughs> in our new engagement that I completely forgot it. And I've never been able to remember it since. So I definitely left the story open for, for possibility of more, but um, I haven't quite found like what that would be yet so uh, but i'll never say never to that sort of thing you know i really enjoyed making that book and as a creative exercise it was fantastic i mean i got to you know i was studying a lot of alex toth and, and darwin cook and doing you know like limited color palette stuff and more more you know um well like sparser line work and things like that so uh, i would love to to dip back back into that again did it uh change your art style moving forward in terms of speed or just general process or anything i'm assuming you did those things those shortcuts to kind of generate more in a, in a quicker fashion to to do the digital thing it was a bit of that and also because i knew it was going to you know with this particular imprint it was like one screen one iphone screen was equaled one panel more or less yes so i wanted to do something a little more pared down so that it would read better on that and also just as an experiment to like, see if I could pull off doing more with less, you know? Sure. Um, I think it did teach me a lot more about, you know, things like using black ink and, you know, spotting the blacks and, and more effective framing and things like that. I, I definitely do. I mean, you'll see in, in count and retroactive, they're both very like Mark heavy. I do a lot of lines. on it. Um, yeah. So yeah. I, I certainly didn't pull back from that standpoint but i think just as an overall approach I, I learned a lot about you know less is more outstanding man well again you're you're in this uh spy milieu and mm -hmm. and jaeger was part of that and certainly now retroactive do you have other retroactive stories that you'd like to do no you know that one i've i've i feel pretty good about kind of putting a bow on it and uh, oh henry thank you so much my friend it's good nice comment for from henry barajas yeah. absolutely that you're uh, one of the best in the business i agree Absolutely. Too kind, my friend. Um, check out Henry's work, by the way. Uh, Absolutely. Fantastic writer on top of yeah, he's kicking comics ass. guy in general. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah, you know, so Retroactive has a nice button on the end of it, I think. And and I'm pretty happy with that being where it is. Um, there is more I'd like to do in the world of Count, though. So that's something that I'm definitely exploring. I remember you saying that, man. Yeah, that uh, we hadn't heard the, the last of Count from that first volume. So that's good to hear. Um, yeah. And also, I'm really, I mean, obviously, you're not, uh, I'm assuming you're not adverse to collaborating again in the future, but, um, or are you, or do you really just want to do your own thing right now? No, you know, I, I, I mean, like, I, I actually, on April 20th, I have a, a Doctor Strange one shot coming out. Uh, awesome. With, yeah. Ralph Macchio wrote it. The, the, you know, hey, that's the great. Marvel guy, not the karate kid, but <laughs> I no, was going no, to say that because people go, what? The yeah. legendary Marvel uh, guy that's yeah. been there for decades, I mean, and I'm so glad that he's back with a new story. Yeah, 45 year joined. veteran, something like that. I mean, he's yeah, um, yeah. yeah. So that was a lot of fun. It's very, very throwback to the the uh, Lee Ditko era style of story. Um, and uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I love collaborating, especially on work for higher stuff because 
you know, there, there are people with better minds for, for, you know, certain stories than I have certainly. So to collaborate with them is great. Um, is that a one shot? Is it just uh, 20 pages? Where, yeah. How many pages? Yeah. It's kind of, you know, cause Dr. Strange is dead in current continuity. So it's yes. sort of like a little story out of, out of the past, just a little vignette. That's, you know, that's why I love what I, I truly, I'm glad that the big two DC and Marvel, when it comes to, uh, the comics, they're not beholden to the, the movies, but by the same token, it's like, Hey, you know, your character is dead right now. And a big movie is about to come out in a week or two. What the hell are you doing? Yeah, and I'm glad yeah. because <laughs> I don't know if you remember the classic example of, uh, God, you got a big movie coming and the continuity is not reflecting it was when the first X-Men movie was out in 99. And they even had a chance to either feature, I don't even remember if it was a, um, a special scene just for TV Guide or I'm assuming it really was just, hey, we're going to take a segment of the, the comic and put it in TV Guide. They did it or Entertainment Weekly. It was certainly one of the big media publications. Yeah. You didn't know what the fuck was happening in the story. <laughs> and it's just like, well, it's really confusing the movie people. The comic book people are unsatisfied because it's not a full story or whatever. Right. You really kind of blew it. You shit the bed. You didn't. <laughs> X-Men's a tough one to do that with, too, because there's almost never like a movie could come out at any time. And there's almost never like a, a core you know, sort of regular X-Men representative book on the shelves, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, Chronicle of the Nerds. Great question regarding uh, um, a, re a retroactive. Uh, what time travel stories inspired you? And of course, he also wants to know how you're doing. Also, I, th I think that's a, also how you doing. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thank you. Very good, Joey. I'm X doing well. Great. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, dear friend, uh, Mikey there, Chronicle of the Nerds. Thank you, man. Cool. Um, time for what travel? Well, so Groundhog Day, as I mentioned, is part of the sort of elevator pitch sure. of the book. Like that's a huge one. It's it's sort of the time loop story, right? Um, but Edge of Tomorrow also was a big one because fantastic story. Yeah, great movie, and it does it in a way that's like a serious time loop thing, you know. Um, but honestly, one of the big ones, and this is like a, a not very well known show at all. There was a show, and I think it was maybe like two thousand four, two thousand five. I think it was on Fox and it was called Daybreak starring Tay Diggs. And it he was like an LAPD detective who was framed for like the mayor's murder or, or, you know, the city council person or something. Okay. And, and his day just kept looping until he was able to solve it. Um, so yeah, it was a, a really cool example of like taking that subgenre and, you know, making it yeah. like a cool thing. And so I've always wanted to do a time loop thing and, the natural thing for me was like, well, mash it up with espionage. Cause that's, I've not seen that done and that's my, you know, favorite genre. And so it seemed like pretty ripe for, you know, messing with. And so, and also I think the only other time loop type of story that we've seen in comics was yeah. Alan, Alan knows daybreak. He's got my DVD set actually. That's how you, yeah. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing that they made a DVD of uh, Yeah, cool. it, it was super hard to find. I don't remember. I think I found I'm it sure. on, yeah, online somewhere, but um, yeah. Uh, so uh, I don't know a lot of people know this, but Edge of Tomorrow was based on a book called All You Need Is Kill. I believe it was a Japanese novel. That's right. And then it was adapted into a manga as well. Yep. So that manga, as far as I know, is the only other sort of time loop story out there in comics. Um, and so there was a lot of real fertile ground to work with because like not much had been done with it at all. So I really just went to town on like the visual symbolism and, and playing with what comics as a medium can do. You know, there's, there's one page in the book where you literally physically have to turn the book around in a circle, like 360 degrees to read the page. And the way I formatted it, like, obviously you'll know when you're done because you've read all the panels on the page, but you could just keep going. And, and it happens <laughs> at a point in the book when, you know, the character is like starting to kind of question his own sanity and stuff. And so, um, yeah, I did a lot of that kind of stuff to try to just, you know, even the cover of the book itself, you know, the layout is kind of like a playing card. So you have, you know, two images depending on, and there's even like a circle arrow in the center that we use as a symbol throughout the book as like every time a new day restarts. And so that kind of gives you direction just looking at the cover, like, oh, if I flip it, there's a different image, you know. Are you so, a are you a Star Trek fan? I, you know, I've not seen much of it. I like what I've seen, but I've just never taken the full plunge. 
There's a but, great time loop. Uh, there's a couple uh, time loop episodes, but the better one is called Cause and Effect. Okay. I'll and right and it's it's really well done. And they were really smart to, as they do the loop, they do subtle camera differences as they're repeating the day and repeating scenes as they sl- slowly suspect, wait a minute, something's wrong. Yeah, everybody's experiencing deja vu. We've done this yeah. before. And they slowly kind of figure it out and to get themselves out of it. And then, of course, at the end, this isn't really spoiling because, of course, it's the journey. How do they b- break out of it? They come out of it and it's like, yeah, we've been stuck in this twilight for like 27 days. And they're like, Jesus Christ. You know, like, you know, <laughs> Is really- that... About. Is that original series or is that one of the newer? It's next generation. And actually they had another one called, I want to say timescape. That's, that's also good, but not as good as cause and effect. Cause and effect is amazing. It's really, right. it was really smart. Uh, sadly, and not, uh, we won't go off on a tangent, but I'm not a big fan of current new Star Trek. I wish it was better. I, I know because- that about you and I feel for you, man. Cause you know, every time we get like a new thing, it's like, Oh, it's cool. There's, we finally got more. And then it's like, eh. If it's not good, it really it's a punch to the gut, you know. I hear you. Man. Gabe Harvey right now is saying, "Shut up, John. Enough. <laughs> we know you don't like it. Move on." Absolutely, man. Oh, oh Alan, is- you keep those DVDs as long as you want, man. No worries. I was just, uh, yeah, it's <laughs> it's all good, dude. You know, Alan I is a dear, dear friend. Break, a lot of a lot of shows that you know half season or whatever, along with DVDs. Uh, thank God, man, YouTube every now and then there's some YouTuber that's like uploading this shit. Yeah. I just found a Western that Robert Urich did in the mid 90s where um, he wakes up with no memory and is accused of killing somebody and has to reclaim his name. And that's that's up there on YouTube. And I was just curious. Huh. Or I had um, the guy, Robert Costanzo, who played Harvey Bullock on the Batman animated series. Mm-hmm. And he's like, you know, in the 90s, I did this great show with... Um, uh, from uh, NCIS, uh, Mark Harmon. Oh, okay. and, uh, and he goes, it was called Charlie Green. He goes, only made it half a season, but it was really good. And he goes, I was really proud of it. And I looked it up and there's six episodes. So I'm like, oh, I want to nice. see this. This is good, you know. I think like Daybreak that. was a mid-season cancel. And then so I think DVD was the only way to finish it unless you could find it online somewhere. Oh, yeah. they, oh so did they make an episode to wrap up the story? Yeah, I, I've seen the complete thing. Um and it and it ends in a in a way where there could have been more, you know, a second season or something. But um, uh, what I can't remember the actor's name, but the guy who plays Mike Ehrman Trout on Breaking Bad, he was on it. Uh, it had, a, it had a, oh, that's a yeah, people. I know that guy, and I can't think of his name right yeah. now either. But he's one of my favorite character actors. He was on Wise Guy. Yeah, um, he was the think, he was the spy. He was the spy master on Wise Guy, for, the handler for um, Ken uh, Wall. Who else that was guy plays Mike? Uh, the actor actress, I think her name is Moon. Blood good. Yes. Uh, she's she in, was it. in Falling Skies. Yeah. That and, TNT alien yeah. show. Yes, I got to meet her on a press junket. Very nice lady. And were you able act- to speak? Because I would have just <laughs> you know, Eve, I'm so glad you said that because then actually over this weekend I was telling my friends, they're like, you know, you get to talk to a lot of like interesting people, and sometimes like Kareem Abdul Jabbar or whatever. And thank God, t- 10 years of sports radio, my first 10 years. I really like my Chris Farley moments of, oh, my God, I can't believe I'm talking to this yeah. person and I'm not going to be able to complete a sentence. I can just put it in the back of my head and it's there, but just kind of keep my cool. And Moon was, yes, she's a lovely woman, but I, I was able to keep my cool and talk about the show with her. The best example of that was Malin Ackerman, who played Silk Spectre in Watchmen. Oh, yeah. And I, among other things, b- uh, Billions and things, other shows. So I'm talking to her she couldn't have been more hypnotically beautiful and uh, well, I'll just leave it at that. I don't want to be Joe Biden sniffing her hair or anything like that, but (laughs) it really was like I was hypnotized by her, but luckily my reflexes kept my cool. And I'm like, all right, Marina Bacardin was like that as well from of course the Deadpool movies Mm -hmm. and Firefly. And I mean, that's the thing. You're just in the presence of these, you know, I mean, hell, even the beautiful men, for God's sakes, Patrick Wilson and uh, Billy Crudup from Watch It, Watch Me <laughs> yeah. stuff. Good dudes, really great. And I'm just like, and actually with Patrick, it was just more of like a culmination of, all right, this is the sixth uh, cast member I've talking to. And I'm like, we're with, um, um, and <laughs> he put his hand up and so he's like, Patrick Wilson. I'm like, yes, Patrick Wilson. I'm so sorry. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, no, it's it's funny. But yeah, it is it is hard. But uh, thankfully, I, I'm able to. Uh, Hats off to you, man. Uh, I would have probably said something yeah. dumb like, "Do you like dogs?" Exactly. <laughs> she's, no, but she's cool. God, I have and truly, I hadn't thought of her 
since falling skies. So that's cool. That's another reason to check out Daybreak. I yeah. love it. Yeah, it's good. Very, very cool, man. That's so, that's so goddamn funny. Um, now, you know, we talked, well, first of all, here, let me get another qu- uh, question for, um, here we go. Uh, Aishim wants to know, as a writer, will you collaborate with other artists? That's a really good question. Um, it That possibility is certainly on the table. Um, you know, I think if something, I mean, my, my goal, ideally, I would write and draw all my own stuff, um, even work for hire. I think if if it were to come about where I was supposed to write and draw something and scheduling just got too crazy, then I, you know, I might write it and somebody else draws it. But um, my plan is to do both myself. Sure. No, I don't blame you. Well, a couple other uh, collaborations that I wanted to mention. Um, you have a story in this uh, Moon Knight uh, collection. Yeah. What is that called? That collection? Marvel. I'm assuming Moon Marvel Knight? versus Moon okay. Knight. I mean, that was I the was... cover. I was trying to find it the other day to tell somebody about it. And I, I could not for the life of me, remember what it was called. Like, you know, cause there's a bunch of moon Knight collections, but yeah. Yeah. I'm going to look that up and see, because um, you're right. And also this collection has, it seems a bunch of one shot stories from over the decades, much is in there. Yeah. A lot of people. Yeah. The, the story I did was with Colin Bunn and uh, Mike Spicer. Um, and it was a, it was part of that acts of evil, uh, event that they did where it was just kind of yep. pairing up like weird uh vil- heroes and villains so we had um moon knight versus kang in that one and okay that was great because uh you know then the loki show came out and everybody wanted kang pages and i had them <laughs> that's now awesome. the moon knight shows out and everybody wants moon knight pages and who's i had them <laughs> who's your uh, art rep uh just me yeah i just do it all myself oh, yeah um okay yeah, I you know I I've thought like I used a rep once in the past and and uh, he actually would I like I would do a commit I'd finish a commission and he wouldn't send it forever and then it, people would be like uh is that done yet and I'd be like yeah I've been, that's not done cool. it forever. yeah so I <laughs> so I kind of ditched that and then um, obviously you know there are a lot of really great reps in the business but so far I find that I I just like interacting with people uh, on a you know like. I've been a guy who bought uh, some Moon Knight pages from me recently. We've been emailing back and forth about the show and like talking about it. Like, you don't get that if you're dealing with a, a third party, you know? Oh, hundred um, percent. Yeah. No, that if you've got the time and the inclination, that's I think the fans appreciate that even more. Well, and that's the other thing about it is like either way, I'd still have to pack up art pages and mail them, and that's the worst part of it. That'd be the reason I would have a rep in the first place. Sure. But I'd have to send the pages to the rep. So it's like either way, if I'm going to mail them, I might as well keep, you know, 100% of it instead of sharing it. And then, like I said, obviously, you know, I get to have nice interactions and stuff about, you know, the the artwork or, you know, sometimes like, I mean, gosh, I just had somebody buy one for his brother-in-law. And like, that was a really nice gesture. And I started talking to the guy about that. And, you know, so yeah, um, it's it's a nice thing to be able to like, chat with the people who who pick up your stuff and sometimes people want to know about the process they go hey so i noticed the page has this on it like can you tell me about that and then you know so yeah it's uh it's it's fun absolutely man all right here's the deal on uh marvel verse moon knight i looked it up on amazon here it's available both digitally and uh as a hard paperback the paperback's only 9.99 oh wow and um geez doug munch cullen bunn mike fleischer sinkevich you uh, among the creators that are involved, it's 109 pages. For 10 and months? uh, let's see, when did it come up? Wow. It came out, it came out uh, last month, uh, the ninth. Nice. So, Check. there you go. And it makes sense because, again, much like this Doctor Strange that you've got coming out in a couple weeks, you know, uh, having uh, the Moon Knight show, it didn't surprise me that, again, I, I think both companies are very smart now and are like, yeah. of course, we're going to put out a comic book to. Uh, have people that are curious for more stories about whether it's Peacemaker for DC or Moon Knight for Marvel or Doctor Strange now. So that's great. Hey, let me tell you, bless Marvel for for putting that collection out because I've done one Moon Knight comic in my entire career and that's it. And the fact that it's coming out when the show is out. uh, Thank you all very much (laughs) because I don't. Yeah, I've, I've not had the type of career where I'm working on, you know, these big characters like and I get a, a nice run under my belt, and then you just get that mailbox money from it for a long time. So, you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll take it. 
Absolutely. No, that's terrific, man. Very, very cool. And then also um, this Wolverine uh, yes. thing you did, Wastelanders. And it was Stephen Denight, who, who uh, one of my favorite television writers, Angel, Daredevil, among other great shows that uh, he's been involved with. So tell me about this thing. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. So Marvel has like a podcast series that is, um, you know, in this Wastelanders, Old Man Logan universe. And so these were done as like a tie-in to the podcast. Um, that was one of the most fun projects I've ever done. Uh, Stephen Denight is a fantastic writer and is just a super nice guy, like great collaborator. And, um, you know, like storytelling wise, I mean, all of the sensibilities that he has in there were just like right up my alley. So it was all stuff I love to draw. Wolverine's always been one of my favorite characters. And so, you know, and I love old man Logan, like as a story, right? I mean, I am so with you. And yeah. I mean, the movie is fantastic and I really have loved all the Marvel comics revolving. And honestly, there was a big part of me that was like, you know, you want to keep there. There are more than enough young, vibrant Wolverine stories. I really appreciated this alternate Wolverine being part of the regular 616 universe. Yeah. And I'm like, that is really a great role for him. It's just like uh, uh dark Knight and Batman beyond Bruce Wayne, yeah. where it's like, there's really something. Cool. And that's why I'm excited for Michael Keaton uh potentially you know being in the flashpoint movie and everything but i really hope they kind of keep him around because it's like no you, you know it's like these are the people that have they've seen it all and and they have that great perspective even the uh, golden age superman in uh final crisis and uh kingdom come uh the the not only the mini series but putting him in the uh, justice society book as yeah. old man Superman, because they do, they have the weight on their shoulders. They've seen the destruction and the, you know, the, the, dis I mean, we see it in the cover there, you know, he's the, he's the only one left. There's all right. the memories of the great arrows behind him. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's, so he's got that pain uh, along with, well, I still got to do the job. And I think that's yeah. a, a great trope to uh, explore in comics. Yeah. And old man Logan has one of my favorite all time tropes, which is like the, the person with the violent past who doesn't want to be that anymore, but the past comes a, a calling, baby. What are they going to do? They you pull know? me back I in. Yes. Those calls. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. No. Yeah. And again, that's uh, truly, I love that. You know, I haven't listened yet to those uh, audio dramas in that verse. I know Ben Percy has been writing a lot of it mm -hmm. and I know they have old man star Lord, which I think is an intriguing idea. And it's star Lord and rocket uh, from that uh, universe yeah. kind of, kind of dealing with the wastelands and stuff. So no, I'm, I'm very, I'm very intrigued. And I keep asking uh, my television friends that write and that are into comics and stuff, Rodney Barnes and Mark Bernard. And I'm like, what do you guys think of audio? Do you want to, do you want to play an audio drama? Of course, coming from radio and stuff. And I'm a sucker right. for old time radio. Are you a noir? Uh, radio guy, have you ever listened to some of the uh, great radio detective stuff from the 40s and 50s? I'm aware of it, but I haven't dived into it. However, a buddy of mine named Matthew Klein, uh, who was the, I believe, like the sales rep at Valiant for a while, and now he is like a sales rep at, I think, Penguin Random House. Oh, wow. Good uh, for him. Yeah, I think he's specifically, or maybe he's the Marvel rep at Penguin Random. He's something, at, you know, still with book sales. He was doing a like an audio series of the question that was like just an unofficial thing that oh wow. know, he's a writer and yeah and it was very much done in that style. Um, I wish I could remember the name of it off the top of my head, but but people should look it up because oh, you know, totally that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, it was and it was very well acted, very well written. Like it was a lot of fun. So yeah. Well, and for retro old time stuff, if you really are interested, listen. I mean, it, Jack Webb as Joe Friday and Dragnet is kind of you know at this point a cartoon character, but he had a show before that called Pat Novak for Hire. And it is radio noir. I mean, obviously, nice. noir is atmospheric and very visual in its portrayal. But but as far as just classic noirs telling it, as it happened in the books as well, femme fatales and leading guys into wrong things and stuff, there's tons of radio like that that was coming out along with the short stories and paperbacks and pulp stories. And um, Jack Webb is one of the best practitioners of it as a star and even a writer. Pat Novak for Hire was just a great... Uh, show he's like I always like to say in fact I just posted it was his birthday recently and I'm like think of Pat Novak as after Dragnet that something happened to Joe Friday and he's a disgraced cop and he, oh, yeah. <laughs> he has to go be a PI yeah, yeah. and he's yeah. working on the it's in San Francisco and it's uh, he he rents boats on the waterfront and it's 
very atmospheric. You hear the foghorn and you hear the sound effects of okay. like that dock atmosphere. It's it's really, really good. So yeah, I'll I, check it out because I do listen to a lot of audiobooks while I work. And you know, those are those are obviously, you know, very adjacent to that experience. So as a Bond guy, have you ever heard the BBC adaptations of the novels? Yes. I have listened to a couple of those. Um I, something about those I I prefer. I prefer the novels because they they take out a lot of the narration of, um, you know, just I guess a lot of the omniscient narration, right? Because they're they're sort of bridging that gap with the vocal performances and sound effects and things like that. And I love like the language that Fleming would use when describing, you know, a room and things like that. So sure. um, I don't I don't do that style as much uh, when it's adapted from a from a novel, but. Um, speaking of novels, I'm a big fan of the Reacher series, and I'm assuming you watched the Amazon show. And I know your dad was an MP, so I'm curious what you thought about it from that standpoint. Loved it. Loved it. And also, that actor is perfect. No disrespect to Tom Cruise, because I think his Reacher thing was fine. And if he wants to make more, so be it. But, God, that's the same guy that you know played Hawk from Hawk and Dove in the Titans right. TV show. And I never would have thought of him for Jack Reacher. And it's like, God damn, he's perfect. And as they I, announced him, I was like, of course. Yeah. <laughs> and, he, and he really is. He's likable. I mean, I, I really, even as Hawk in Titans, uh, there are just certain art or uh, certain actors. John Barenthal, uh, not only as mm-hmm. the Punisher, but immediately when he was uh, Shane in The Walking Dead, it's like that guy. That guy has my attention. I don't know why, but he gets it. The camera clicks with him. And I think the Reacher guy is so like that as well. But you're right. Uh, my yeah, my dad was an MP3 or an MP3. Ha! My dad was an MP3. He was, a, he was an audiophile. Uh, yeah, yeah. I was raised by a top forty uh, piece of music <laughs> in only three minutes, so we didn't really get to know each other quite well. Um, anyway, he was an he was an MP. Uh, yeah, in the army during the post war years, and that's why for people, if you've never heard me talk about this, the great Graham ne- Grand Green novel and film that was adapted from it, The Third Man. Uh, my dad loved that because he kind of lived that world as an MP in uh, the post-world uh, Vienna in Germany when it was still in four territories. You had the uh, U.S., the British, the French, and the Russians uh, all policing the each quarter of that city. And there was a lot of black marketing going on because goods were scarce. And, yeah. you know, I mean, so, yeah, it was like just kind of part of the gig that the army was just kind of looking for people – exploiting the situation and making money and kind of shitting on the people and stuff. I mean, sometimes providing good stuff, but also providing a lot of fake lousy stuff as well, which is the point of the story of uh, the third man. So yeah, I was like, wow, man, uh, my dad's like, Hey, you want to see what I did in the army? I'm like, yeah. Cause he's like, yeah. I was in the occupation. You think, and as, especially as a little kid, and unfortunately, the glorification of, well, it's not like you were shooting people or anything like that, Dad. So why would I care? And it's like, actually, I was doing this kind of police work and stuff. And it's like, oh, my God, that's really amazing. And so, yeah. so yeah, man, no, you're right. <laughs> so, yes, Reacher is cool. And, yeah, I, I do I do uh, appreciate those stories. It's, uh, it's pretty great. And, and I, again, I think uh, – I think the Amazon shows a good representation and I'm sure, I'm sure they're going to do more. I'm oh, sure they are. Yeah. They've already. Yeah. I'm super okay. happy. And, and I feel like they've, they planted the seeds for, which is one of my favorite books coming up with some of the stuff they did in this first season. Um, I, there were a couple of like nods to things that happen in this other book that I'm like, oh, I hope they do that one. And it, it, the book takes place in LA and Las Vegas. So I feel like, I think it's like the fifth or sixth, maybe in the 11th Reacher book or something in the series, but um, it makes sense that they could pivot straight to that one. And, you know, for just for filming production alone, right? Like filming it in Los Angeles. So, yeah. That's excellent, man. Well, you know, we're talking to Ibrahim Mustafa, and I want to take a break for a second and acknowledge one of our great sponsors. We'll be right back because uh, not only is Ibrahim a great artist, but uh, he's quite the craftsman. And I'll explain if you don't already know. In just a second. Every part of comics and artwork is a form of communication with other people. It's not just a, here, let me direct my thoughts at you as a dictation of concept, but it's hoping to convince you of 
how cool you think a visual could be or a story could be. And you're trying to communicate ideas and in one part storytelling and greater part just graphic impact. You're hoping to relate a sense of energy, urgency, and enthusiasm to people. That there's a lightning of spirit that comes out of superheroes that has always worked for me. That it isn't really about the practicality of what they might do about, it's not the practicality about grown men punching each other in costumes. It really isn't about that. It's a visual metaphor. And that metaphor could be for a lot of things, but it's mostly just about the energy and enthusiasm that can be found in the fun of life. Back with more from Ibrahim Mustafa here on Word Balloon. And uh, as I said, Ibrahim is a hell of an artist and we love his comics and looking forward to more. Of course, uh, the current comic that we're talking about is um, Retroactive from Humanoids. Uh, and that is it. Is it out now or is it out in a couple of weeks? Uh, uh, it comes out on the, on the 26th of April uh, in bookstores and then the 27th in comic shops. So it's that little Tuesday, Wednesday book market, comic market uh, schedule. But. Yeah, so uh, I'm uh, just a couple weeks away. I'm very excited. I, I'm, I, I, you know, without sounding hopefully not, uh, you know, douchey. I think it's the best thing I've done, and so Congrats. <laughs> hey, that's awesome, man. I, no, absolutely, it should be a progression, and you should feel like that. I mean, my God, uh, you know, every book should be a little bit better and stuff. So that's wonderful to hear. It's uh, the the second in three books that he's doing for humanoids. We, uh, we uh, of course, had the count last year. That's the last time we spoke to Ibrahim. So that's available now from Humanoids as well. But uh, as I said, along with uh, his great art, uh, Ib uh, does uh, uh, some amazing stuff, uh, not only appreciating action figures, but creating his own uh, action figures as well. And I, I told him, I'm like, before we start broadcasting, I'm like, I want you to grab a couple. I want to see what you've been working on. So. Yeah. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna single out Ibrahim here, and uh, he'll show us uh, his, some of his fine work in the uh, in the uh, action figure business. So these are a couple that are in process right now, um, or in progress rather. Uh, I'm working on a line of the uh, like Christopher Nolan Dark Knight trilogy uh, representations of the figures. So I've got an Alfred here. Oh, uh, nice! It's Michael Caine. It's right, my bloody Michael Caine. That's right, mm -hmm. Master Bruce. I've buried enough Batman. I don't want to bury anymore. He's the size of a tangerine. Uh, <laughs> now this is this is a Hot Toys head that was shrunken down. You can, okay. you can use like a, a shrinking resin that reduces in size as it cures. Wow. So, uh, yeah, and then you can find them online. I get some from a, a guy in Canada on eBay. Well, now this they, one. Wait a minute. I want to ask about this resin. Like, yeah. so how is it precise or, or do you have to stop the process of shrinking to get it, you know, properly to fit on a body or whatever? It actually happens in stages and I don't know all of the ins and outs of it, but from what I've gathered, essentially, you, you know, you have a hot toys head that's about this, this big, you know? Okay. Compared. Yeah. 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 We'll and see. then you take a, you basically make a mold of this using like silicone uh, and then you know, so it's it's like any kind of molding casting process you may have seen on like a behind the scenes thing for how do they make you know this Hellboy's face or whatever. Okay. Um, and then essentially, you the resin you use is probably like a two part solution. You you know mix them together, and then as it cures, it shrinks by I think maybe half, and then you have to mold that one, and then do ah, so. It happens in stages. Yeah, I understand. Very so cool. I think I after it. like three or four versions of it, you end up with that. Okay. Before you show the next uh, figure uh, regarding Michael Caine, did we both learn how to do Michael Caine from that awesome movie, The Trip, with oh, Rob Ryan Steve, and Steve Coogan? Steve Coogan, absolutely. Yeah. And then also just listening to him say the size of a tangerine. That's my Great. favorite. Like, I, <laughs> yeah. mine is yeah. You only you're only supposed to blow the bloody doors off from the Italian <laughs> job, of course. And. Um, it's literally this weekend, my Hall of Fame weekend. I'm with my college buddies. They're like, "Give us some new uh, voices." I'm like, "Well, I can do Michael Caine, and I'm not <laughs> yeah. proud. I'm not. I'm not as good, but I'm close." And it's because, oh, that's good. You know, I'm like, you know, it was awesome. Rob, uh, picky in the brain. Rob, uh, damn it, I can't think of his name. Now the voiceover actor. Oh, um, but it's yeah. Rob. He's always at the cons. He's amazing. Uh, he's like, "Hey, that's Paulson? good." <laughs> is it Rob Paulson? It is Rob Paulson. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Eve. That's yes. And he's yeah. like, "Hey, that's really good." And I'm like. Steve Coogan and Rob yeah. Brydon, man, the trip. 
So, God, I love – and I told them because they're like, you know, voices, and I'm sure you feel the same way because you're doing it. Like when you find a, a character, a celebrity voice and it's in your vocal range and you and they somebody else cracks the code, it is like, oh, that's so great. That's how you do it. Yeah, I, and – See, that's the problem. I, I I don't I don't have the range most of the time. Like I can I can get the nuance, but I can't I don't I can't mimic the sound. You know, it's so. um Dana Carvey uh, is on. I, I don't know if you listen to this podcast. It's relatively new. It's called um, Fly on the Wall. It's a Saturday Night Live podcast. That Dana oh, it's him and uh, David, David Spade. Spade. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard of it. I haven't seen or listened to it yet. But and you know, depending on who the celebrity is, Carvey will break into voices and he talks about. That same thing of, oh, so-and-so, you know, Kevin Pollack cracked the code on Christopher Walken. So, like, that's what taught me how to do it, yeah. you know, and, and it's true. It's like, and it, it's like singing. Doing doing voices is like singing. It's either in, because there's voices I can't do or I can approximate, but you don't have the tonal quality of the person's right. voice. But that was why. So, yeah, no, Michael Caine, you know, is, it's is like, there, oh, there it is. All right, great, you know. Is there one you wish you could do that you just can't? Oh, there's a hundred that I wish I could do that I can't. And I, I right now I can't think of any yeah. uh, to, to, to give you an explanation. But, oh, yeah, no, a lot of times it's like, no, not there. Even my, I would say my Christopher Walken isn't really there uh, to give a, an example. But, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, again, it's it's all, it's music. You know what I mean? And, yeah. you know, you got the ear and you're like, all right, wait, okay, that's the that's the meter of it. That's the rhythm of it along with uh, the tonal quality. And it's you put them together. Do you think some people like the great impressionists, like the, the, the Jay Pharaohs and the, uh, uh, who was the mad TV guy? Uh, yeah. The, uh, Cal, 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 Caliendo, Frank Caliendo. Yeah. Frank Caliendo. You think they have some kind of vocal cord thing that just like, it's like a superpower. Mel Blank had his voice box examined and, the guy who did it said the only other voice box I saw like that was Enrico Caruso, the great opera singer. Oh, wow. so yes, I do. Okay. Yes, I do. And so I it's mean, like they just have more access to different muscles. And, yeah. yeah, I guess. And, and again, it's, and it's the ear and yeah. again, it's the tone, you know, but they like blank state in his range. They'd speed up his voice. They'd slow it down for different voices to a degree. June Foray, the great, uh, female voice actor mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, it's funny. My buddy Susan Eisenberg is such a natural voiceover actress, Wonder Woman on the Justice yeah. League. Oh, yeah. And Enchantress on the uh, recent Masters of the Universe that Kevin Smith made. Um, I never really talked to her about impressions. And really, the next time I have uh, Rob on as well, I've got I've to ask him um, about you know, yeah, just that, that like, what do you think it is in our, in our voices that like kind of allow us to do it? Because truly, that was a big part of my broadcast career in radio, especially at the sports radio station, imitating players, imitating owners and coaches and things like that. And that, I mean, I, I don't know shit about sports. I mean, I, I'm a, you know, other than just being a basic fan, I never break down strategies or anything. And me, I'm just watching how goofy they sound when they're doing their after uh, game interviews and stuff, you know? So that's always been my thing. Like I can, I can, like, I've always been an, you know, known among my friends for doing voices and impressions and stuff. And I can, it's that same thing where it's like, I can hear, you know, like I can mimic certain like Denzel, you know, with the, the kind of mouth stuff and the point, you know, I don't you ever in your life. Right. But I can't do his, like his normal voice stuff. And that's what always gets me. That's what I feel like has always kept me from being like really good at it is like just the, the, you know, the small you gotta, stuff. You got to come on uh, the all yeah podcast that I do with Art and Franco. Oh, yeah, Art and Franco. And yeah. Buddy. Yeah, and our buddy uh, Skokie Spidey, uh, Mike, who Mike does great voices, and he's he's a big uh, commercial actor and voiceover actor. And man, I just like it's pulling teeth trying to get him to do like improv with me because he does a great Paul McCartney, and I'm like, I can do a decent John Lennon, and I'm like, come on, man, oh great, we'll we'll make a new song, it'll be great. I don't want to make a song today. I don't feel like <laughs> you know. And it's like, come on, let's go, let's play. You know, bounce the ball back and forth. So it's tough because he just like he just gets shy, and I'm like, unless he's doing it on his own, and he's great. So I'm 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 pulling it from him slowly. If, he's got to take more improv classes to learn how to team play. But we need to get you in there, man. If I come on there, you and I will have to have a segment called Dueling to Dios. Oh, that that'd be great. I I love talking to like Dan. I know I'm out I love of talking about our core characters. You know, uh, <laughs> we'll just <laughs> we'll just be a Dio soundscape. <laughs> uh, and I just and I know it's a it's a notorious name these days, but I just love him saying Ethan Van Skyva. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but a great, great book. We got Jeff Johns. We got Ethan Van Skyver. It's gonna be really great. I'm oh man, it. my friend, I won't, I won't blow his spot because I don't know if he wants to be known for this, but you know, he he obviously can't stand that guy, and he does an incredible <laughs> impression of him just saying. What is what is the word? What does he always say? Uh, I don't even know. Uh, something about like I don't know if it's social justice warriors or something, but he 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 takes this term and just like puts this. Oh God, it's so good. I wish I could. I wish I could remember what it was and and do it in kind. But yeah. Anyway, uh, dueling the deals. No. <laughs> yeah, no, I hear you, man. No, and it's and truly, I mean, well, you know, b- before Ethan went off the pier, I, I used to have my word balloon a lot, and it's like. All right, yeah, <laughs> like just oh, don't, just don't I remembered it. Anybody. Oh, please, he, he says SJWs, and that's just, true. I can't do it the way he does, but it's so funny. The I, and he'll but do I it know. As he's making fun of the guy, and it's See, like hilarious every time. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't even do that. I mean, and again, I've I've certainly heard Ethan's voice enough to know it, but no, that's why it's like you know, that's your you got it, man. You certainly have a piece of it, so. If you want to work on it, that's right. Very- well, you know, I think I think most of the good impressions most of us hear are just a good impression of someone else's better impression, you know? Yes. <laughs> yes. Of- <laughs> yes. You know, it also sucks, Eve, and I'll say this as a person of color, truly, I, I, I will not deny my disappointment that as much as we want to appreciate everyone's ethnicity and backgrounds, and I firmly believe that, coming from the Mel Blanc, June, June Foray, uh, watching them generation, I can't do two thirds of the uh, the old ethnic voices that I do because people will take offense. And I understand a hundred percent. I would never want to offend anybody. But again, that was another thing that came up over the weekend. And I'm like, I've even heard other comedians, including God, um, Tim Meadows was just on uh, Dana Carvey and David Spade show. And he's like, yeah, you know, I'm starting to do stand up again. I got to watch it. Dave Thomas, the great SCTV comic he's like i can't do two-thirds of what i used to do because it was you know just ethnic you know but not in any mean way just appreciating the music of everyone's ethnicity and and voice and background but again i get it and i don't want to offend and mores change and while people are angry it's like all right it's cool there's there's plenty of white voices i could do like bloody michael k <laughs> michael k exactly you got a list the size of a tangerine john yeah it's it's i mean we're you know I'm glad that we're in a place where, uh, like, we can go. Oh, you know what? I shouldn't have done that shit. Like, <laughs> and I know now, and I won't do it anymore. You know, like, I think that's yes. You know, it's it's good progress. And and uh, I, I yeah. hear you agree. And like I said, I am I am so cool with that. And yeah. like, no, would not would certainly breaking in now would not do the various uh, ethnic voices that I did back. Well, and and kudos to you for one realizing that and two uh i think a lot of people would still do it just cuz like the 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 laugh you get in the moment is like it it supersedes like whatever down the line you might not be able to that's abstract you know but like hey yeah well so, dude i mean literally in a different way we saw that with the will smith chris rock thing where chris rock is laughing and then he sees his wife and like hey she's not laughing oh shit i better do something you know that that's interesting because i feel like what happened was Will Smith is in the front row of the Academy Awards and he's just going along, get along, you know, or to get along because the jokes are flying. Yeah. And I think the camera cut away at just before the moment he might've gone, wait, what? And then looked at his wife. You know what I mean? Like maybe, maybe, yeah, or, or maybe he thought that she was going to go along to get along as well. And he's, I mean, he's an actor after all, right. He was up for the highest honor right. of the evening. Right. So he might've just been, oh, okay. Thinking inside his head, like, this motherfucker, man, like <laughs> I slap him, you know, could be. Hey, man, yeah. no people. I, I, I've i had moments. I literally had a moment at a, a convention in the last year where I flew off the handle and went up blind and made a complete ass of myself and thankfully didn't get banned or anything like that and <laughs> yeah. apologized profusely. Uh, a camera wasn't rolling. I'm certainly I, I'm sure I would have paid for much more consequence in the way that Will Smith had. You know, it's crazy. Uh, BBC America. Uh, after their Star Trek reruns today was running Hancock. And now you can't help but whenever you see a movie of Will Smith, it's like when Kevin Spacey was, you know, canceled and they were still showing Kevin Spacey movies. And it's like, oh, now I have a different feeling when I see that name. And I I, I hate to say that, but I won't deny. I mean, you can't help it right now. It's still fresh in our memories. Yeah, I, I think to Will Smith's credit, like, you know, slapping another grown man is 
not quite on the up as oh, high certainly. on the lat, you know, <laughs> the ladder of Kevin yeah, Spacey. Sexual, sexual abuse of a minor, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, I, you know, it's interesting because I'm, I, that was such a controversial thing. And I know yeah. we're going off on it. You know, I know. I'm like, meanwhile, I actually, <laughs> <go on. laughs> but yeah, like, I just, I, I mean, I'm from a, I'm from a place where like people get slapped, you know, like it's like, it's not really, a lot of times that is the warning, you know, like that's, that's, sure. that's the, sure. Hey, you, you were corrected. Your behavior was corrected, you know? And so to see people, Oh, well, you know, I think, the Judd Apatow's yeah. of the world, he could have killed him, you know, come well, on, bro. <laughs> yeah, no. And I hear what you're saying. I think, it, I think because it was on camera, I don't yeah. think anyone have, well, would have blamed Will Smith. If we read in the magazines, after the Oscars or by backstage, right, Will Smith right. really, you know, lit in the, and maybe even hit him. Like even if he had hit him back then yeah. or whatever. And it was also, I mean, the venue too, right? Like it's, right. it's a yes. very, you know, it's high society type of stuff. And that stuff doesn't happen there, you know? Um, uh, I, dude, I'll be honest. I was for them taking the Oscar away. That was yeah. my feeling. Cause I'm like, you really want to make sure this never happens again. No winner for the best actor. I'm sorry, Mr. Smith. Uh, that kind of behavior will not be tolerated because again, it was on camera in front of the world and it, and it is, it is the Oscars and they need to maintain a level of integrity and, and, and the, I'm sorry, you just, you can't have that kind of public display or there might be more. Right. And that's, that's why I was for even the more severe of take the award away. You really want to hurt him. Take the award away. Well, what's interesting, a lot of people have pointed out that like the Oscars has a real bad track record in and of themselves. I mean, yes. you know, th there was the clip of the the Native American actress, uh, Little Feather, yes, who, yeah, who was accepted for um, Brando, yeah, yeah, and and reportedly John Wayne had to be held back from attacking her, and Clint Eastwood comes up and makes a snide remark, and you know, the the first woman, a woman again, I'm blanking on her name, but to, the first black woman to win an Oscar wasn't even allowed to like sit. At like the same table as other right. people, and then, um, yeah. The from Gone with the Wind, um, and now I'm I'm forgetting her name, but the wonderful actress, the great character actress, Hattie McDaniel. Yes, and um, she wasn't yes. she wasn't allowed to be That's right uh, buried in the Hollywood Cemetery, you know. So, and then of course Roman Polanski won an Oscar for you know, and he he raped someone like on camera or something, right? So yeah. No, listen. You know, again, I'm seeing I'm seeing uh, things in the chat, and we're not gonna we're not gonna go down this road any further. But no, of course, there have always been bad behavior. Hollywood has a litany of bad uh, lack of appreciation of ethnicity and and women yeah. uh, for a very long time. Well, course, all that Harvey is to say, Weinstein and and yeah, and, uh, right. and Roman Polanski. Like I said, I I think the fact that it was on camera is what made it a offense beyond well past winners did x y and z or the right. academy did not do x y and z but that's just me yeah yeah and i you know um i'm also and this is a more problematic viewpoint but like uh you know i i, I was bringing up a lot of people say violence isn't the answer and yeah obviously in a civilized society we hope yeah. to not resort to our baser instincts right but sure. I do think about uh, Richard Spencer, the neo-Nazi frontman guy, who he got knocked out on camera, and we never heard from that man again. <laughs> so it's like, you know, sometimes. <laughs> oh sure, or when yeah. uh, when when uh, Buzz Aldrin punched the uh, moon uh, the, denier, yeah. the moon landing denier, and it's just like, yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine, John? You you go to the moon, like you you live in a in a spaceship. Like, and it sucks for and days. You, you can't for stand days. up and like, you know, you know, everything you eat is liquefied and you, you come back and you're atrophied and you haven't seen your family. And then some jerk is going, that never happened. I hear I, you, man. I'd have hit him too, man. <laughs> like, like, Absolutely. No, I, I truly, and it was great. Uh, Cause he's like in his seventies. <laughs> I just, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Outstanding. It's fine. Right. I, I expect that from a guy named Buzz too, right? Damn straight, sense. absolutely. Yeah. Despite his Yale and Phi Beta Kappa background and all that stuff. Right. All right. So show me more. Anyway, let's get, let's get back to action figures. That was fantastic. <laughs> I don't mind the tangent at all. That was great, Abe. So this one is uh, a James Bond. I'm putting together. Let's get the can. Daniel Craig. Right. That's excellent. Yep. So this is a this is a head. I think this might have been a 3D print that I got. Okay. From China on eBay. 
the body is a was actually a, a Logan Wolverine as the limo driver that this third party un, unlicensed company made. Oh wow! And so what I did was I tightened up, I sewed the collar shut because it was open, you know, and then I made a bow tie out of some kind of like uh, can't think of it like uh, I guess nylon material, you know, the stuff okay. that like a backpack strap might be made out of, but sure. more elastic. And then, uh, you know, I tied the little knot and then I, br- I cut it and, and burn the edges so that they shrink down because the nylon uh, material or, or is it nylon? I don't remember. But yeah, it, under heat, it shrinks. Okay. So, okay. so next up, I'll have to paint this head. That's excellent. And then uh, I might make a cummerbund for him. I have to check it against <laughs> Casino Royale and see what, what his setup was. <laughs> and then I also am going to try a thing where I, I made a Thor out of a, a Chris Hemsworth uh, Ragnarok figure. I made a more classic Thor out of it. Okay, and I took thread and I I painted it blonde and made hair to come out under his helmet. Oh wow! So I have some left over. So I think I'm going to try to give him the longer like Casino Royale hair. You know, understood. Um, and this is part of a I've been doing. Uh, I guess you could call it a series. I don't know for for my own shelves of like vehicles paired with their character, right? So sure. I managed to track down. I don't have it right here, but I tracked oh, okay. down a a. a scaled model of a aston martin the newer like a like a vantage um so i'm gonna pair that with him and make a little casino royale kind of backdrop um but here's one i am working on that i do have the vehicle for now this one is a lot more in line in the line of like the kind of stuff i typically do usually i don't just find a head that works sometimes i have to like figure one out or augment one sure so i'm i'm working on a uh a Michael Knight here. <laughs> and the off. Yes. The head here was um a uh what's the guy from Supernatural? Anson, no, Jensen Ackles. Yes, yes, of course. And yes. I was trying to find the right head to use, and I had it in my bin of like spare parts. Um, and I was like, you know what? He actually looks like Hasselhoff if I if I bulk out the hair and the the cheekbones and the jawline and stuff. So this me. is a pre-paint version, but sure. Um, and then you can find these little clothes, you know, little scale clothing online. Like there's an yes. eBay seller that, so I, I pieced this together. This was a t-shirt and I cut the sleeve off and made it into the turtleneck. And then this, this belt buckle was from a Wolverine figure. Um, and so all that is going to go with my custom kit vehicle that I'm putting together. Outstanding. So this Michael. was a, oh, was it, did you, <laughs> was that, was that your. Yeah, that's my uh, William Daniels for it. I thought you had like a like an audio thing queued up. I was like, that's oh, no. amazing. <laughs> that was right on. Um, yeah, this is my uh, this is my kit I'm putting together. So this was a this was a toy that came out in you know probably eighty three, eighty four. Wow. Yeah, and so the thing I like to do is find these old toys and and or something that's not meant to be a toy and like you know change it to be sure. You know, so this was a Firebird. I took the windows out because they're all scratched up. I have to make some new ones. I got to, I got to convert it into at least looking like a T top. I probably won't, yep. you know, damage the thing here. But sure. And then I made the the front end and the hood <laughs> scoop out of styrene, which is like a you know a plastic sheeting you can get. Yes, yes. Um, so I had to build that out. That was Amazing. very difficult. <laughs> um, and then I actually found a, a company online that makes little red LED lights. So, outstanding yeah i'm gonna have the tracker in there and everything <laughs> um and i'm i'm making a dash out of of you know like this thick insulation foam that you can use to um carve all kinds of shapes out of so like so, you, you know, so you're gonna have detail on the interior as well oh yeah yeah you're insane now, <laughs> i you know what i did you, I, how do you find time to do this given your uh, like amount of time it takes to, to make comics and stuff. That's amazing. It's few and far between, man. I'll tell you, it's, it's, you know, I, it's kind of stolen moments. It's like, you know, every now and then I'll reward myself with a day off before I have a mental breakdown. And that's when I, you know, chip away at this stuff. I've actually, excuse me, I've started a, uh, <laughs> I, well, yeah, I, technically I had a spare Dean Winchester. Yeah, Alan wants I, to know if he had a spare yeah. Dean Winchester to, to, to I bought, to make that. Yeah, I got the head uh, from <laughs> the guy who shrinks them uh, just because I was like, well, I can maybe make a Nightwing out of this or, you know, I'll find some use for it because they're they're pretty inexpensive. You know, it's like eight, nine bucks. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I just had it sitting around because I knew I'd use it for something. And sure enough, I had the exact perfect uh, use for it. So. I've, I've um, told you in the past, um, Art Balthazar also customizes. 
Yeah, I think you said he does like Migo stuff, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. his stuff is Migo size. Yeah. So, but uh, that's amazing. No, continue. I interrupted you. Pardon oh, me. no worries. Um, I, I've actually started a YouTube channel uh, for this stuff. So, you know, I, I have a video. I'm, I'm currently doing a series where I, I got this Batmobile, like a Tumblr from the Christopher Nolan movies. Um, they never made one the size to go with action figures until recently. And it was like $500. And I was like, I'm not, right. you know. <laughs> right. Yeah. So what I found was this old, like from when Begins came out, this like play set that's shaped like a tumbler that opens up and like Gotham City, you know, pops out of it. You know, it's a kid's toy. But sure, it's sure. The right like the Death side. Star, like the exactly. Death Star that used to be there for, for Star Wars and everything. Yep. That was like a whole like play set and everything inside. Exactly. Of it. Or Go like on. those old Star Trek fold out, you know. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I've been uh I've been retrofitting it to be like an actual tumbler to go with my uh batman figure so it's like you know it had these big ugly plastic wheels on it they were just molded plastic i got actual radio control rubber tires that look like you know big rock crawlers to put on the back of it and i'm building the turbine engine out of like the spout of a, a coffee creamer bottle and styrene pieces and you know a lot of kit bashing found object type of stuff absolutely um so yeah it's 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 a ton of fun you know drawing became my job right and sure. so it was like well what do i do for fun now like I, just more work you know so <laughs> yeah it's it's been important for me to have like another creative outlet that isn't just more work essentially i get it man uh coffee uh comics coffee metal wants to know is there a bucket list of toys you want to make yes uh that's a great question thank you um i have designs on making a line of james bond figures uh i i have so sideshow collectibles which very well known in the collectible you know they make they they put out hot toys which are like the you know 12 inch like screen accurate incredible yes, figures very i mean god i've got photos of those that i'll take when i go to conventions and they're yeah. on display and for a second people will go oh my god he was there and i'm like no that's a that's an action yeah. figure they're it's incredible like, oh my god I've got a handful of them and each one is just the detailing. Like, like I have the, the, you know, uh, movie Superman ones, like the Henry Cavill, like I have a couple of them and they have like the, the intricate screen printing, like chain mail design on them. To oh, scale. Yes. Yeah. It's insane. Yes. Um, and, uh, you know, I've got the, I've got the Antonio Bandera, Bandera Zorro one and he's got the embroidery on the cape and the hat and stuff. It's incredible. But oh, yeah, so sideshow a long time ago, put out, like lesser versions of those that were James Bond figures. Okay. Um, and so I have a Timothy Dalton one. Oh, wow. I, yeah. He came in a tux and the body's wonky and stuff. So I put a new body on it. Um, and then I, I put like, I, I tracked down on the internet, you know, a leather jacket and a sweater and a button up and the slack. So he looks like the living daylights. Timothy sure. Dalton. Sure. So now I just need to like re-sculpt the hair because it's a license to kill version. So he's got the slick back look. Okay. And I want yes. that quaff he had, you know. <laughs> and then I got to repaint the face because it's very, they're almost like a Barbie, like a Ken doll, but like a little bit better, right? Yeah. Detailing yeah. wise. So this, I want to paint it to look lifelike. So it looks more like a Hot Toys version, like a, like, you know, and, and that's where you get into like, you know, sort of modeling the skin. So it's got like speckles and you know, capillaries, you know what I mean? The eyes have, yes. yeah, gloss to them and stuff. So, yeah. You you uh, you need to do a Bill Murray and 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 unfortunately simulate his unfortunate uh, skin condition. He's got like pockmarks on his face and stuff, you know? Vamp, oh. for, vamp for 10 seconds. I'll be right All back. right, by all means, talking to Ibrahim. He's showing us his great action figures. See, again, folks, I love that you're listening to the audio, but uh, this is why you need to watch the YouTube channel every now and then to get stuff like this. Uh, and you can appreciate uh, the stuff we see on camera versus all we uh, hear. Oh, there you go, man. Dr. Peter Venkman. I I made a uh, Groundhog Day Phil. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. So I Phil basically. Phil Connors. Phil Connors. <laughs> Ned Ryerson. This exactly. Is a, uh, thing. Yeah. So Mezco, my favorite action figure company, they make six inch figures that are similar to Hot Toys in their quality in terms sure. of, you know, the clothing and stuff. Um, and so I took a, I got, I found someone selling just the spare head of, uh, Bill Murray's <laughs> Ghostbusters figure on eBay. So I got it for a few bucks 
And then the body was a Joker suit that was purple that I painted. Wow. Like I basically dyed it with paint to be like a dark blue. And then I don't, you probably can't see, but I painted Paisley onto his tie. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> And then, you know, I, I had a couple of props. This is from like an April O'Neil figure. And this is from some diamond select figure. Okay. Um, yeah. And I repainted the head to make it a little more lifelike. And I made myself a little Groundhog Day figure. That's awesome. So you got to Dude, I don't know how you get that to Bill Murray, but you got to show him that. That's amazing. And I'm sure he'd freak out and love it at the same time. That is so goddamn great. I, See, this, that's amazing, Eve. Honestly. Thanks, man. Thank and, you. Again, and truly, we have to find a convention where you and Balthazar are together. I love that, yeah. And, and truly just show, I mean, and have the whole hour just be, all right, here's our action figures that we've made. Because really, uh, they're, that's incredible, truly. Thank you. It's a lot of fun, man. And I make dioramas for him. I have all, you know, again, on my YouTube, you can see some of this stuff. Um, I made a uh, Mission Impossible team with a, I got a shrunken Tom Cruise head. And, uh, oh, thank you, Brad. <laughs> Doesn't that sound crazy? Like it's like a voodoo thing, you know, like. Um, and then, you know, there was a, there was a Shaun of the dead figure. So I took oh, wow. the Simon peg head from it. And then there was a, there was a Ving Rhames from Pulp Fiction. So I took that head and, you know, I've made the little mission impossible team. And now I have, um, the Rebecca Ferguson from Dune, they put a figure out of her. So now I can complete the, the team. And I, I made a little warehouse diorama for them. And so they, sure. You know, they have their little face printing head machine on it and stuff. I, I, man, I just, wow, I don't know this stuff. It's so much that's fun. That's fantastic. Oh my God. Jesus. See, and that's funny when you said Simon Fegg. Of course, you're talking about MI, but I'm like, oh, he could make a Scotty for the JJ uh, Abrams Star Trek movies. That I could. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's great, man. She's, and no, like you said, the great thing is, and I know this from art, there are all these great uh, websites that like provide torsos and, uh, uh, certainly custom 3D printed sculpts of faces. Uh, and I'm sure I talked about it in our last conversation. Like you can get a uh, Buster Crab Flash Gordon head right? To, to do, or a Sam Jones Flash Gordon head, very specific and stuff. It's I mean, really yeah. taken off over the last couple of years too. Like with, with 3D printing becoming more uh, ubiquitous, like there's stuff, I mean, when I started doing this about three years ago, there weren't all these options. I started because I, I wanted to make a, a John Wick figure because there weren't any. And now there's, you know, 10 of them. Sure. And of course, I have all those too now. But, <laughs> you know, I, I took a, I took a, I found a McFarlane Toys Keanu Reeves Matrix figure, you know, where he's in the real world, doesn't have the glasses on. And I, you know, cut the hair off of it and molded new hair and put a beard on him and put him on a little suited body. And, you know, it was like pulling teeth to find all those parts. And now it's like, you know, you can... You know, I got this Bond body. It came, you know, like this almost. And yeah. I had to, you know. No, so, it's perfect. Yeah. And so it's much easier. But I do like the challenge of it. I think I I prefer, you know, because somebody asked me recently on YouTube and, and on my Batmobile video, like, would you ever just get a 3D printer? And I was like, eh, probably not. Because, like, the fun thing is taking the thing that already exists for a different purpose and yeah. turning it to my own, you know? Right. No, they take the fun out of it. They're doing all the work for you. I understand. Yeah. I that totally and like I'm I'm really into sustainability and like reducing my carbon footprint. So if I'm taking these old toys that are just destined for a landfill or something and upcycling them and making them a collecting the collection piece, like I feel like I'm doing a little bit of my part, you know. <laughs> would you ever would you ever sell any of your stuff or is that all just for your own enjoyment and and you know gratification of doing it? It's mostly for my own, it's mostly like I want a figure of that and it doesn't exist. Sure. So I'm gonna, you know. But I have sold a few because there's some where I just wanted to make them for the challenge of it, but I didn't like like I made a, a Deadpool one um, for the you know movie Deadpool. I was gonna say fucked up face Deadpool. Yeah, I because uh, again, Shrunken Hot Toys head. I got a little Ryan Reynolds one, and then um, and and I got the Ryan Reynolds shrunken head as or the the Deadpool mask. But I took a, a Netflix Daredevil body, you know, with the fabric suit. You know, it's a little figure this big. Yep, yep. And and I repainted it and added some stuff to it and it, you know, resembled very closely the the movie Deadpool suit. And so that was more of like a I'm going to do it cuz I want to see if it's possible, you know. Um and then so once I made it, I didn't really have a use for it cuz I'm not the biggest Deadpool guy. So I had a friend who was like, "Bro, let me buy that." And I was like, "You got it, man. It's all you." <laughs> That's <laughs> so, beautiful. Outstanding. Yeah. You know what else we got to get in the mix with you and Baltazar is Ed Cato 
and Ed is the licensor of um, Captain Adam, or no, Captain Action, excuse me. Oh, okay, cool. And and you know he's been the guy in the last few years who have who's commissioned Walt Simonson to do a, a Captain Action rubber mask Thor. And, oh, uh, I didn't know about that. You know, yeah, and unfortunately the other creators aren't coming to mind, but he really has, uh, in particular with Marvel heroes gotten really uh intricate uh costumes for the figure and then the right rubber mask where it's like no that's a walt simonson thor you can't that's mess cool it. That's and cool. yeah it's it's fantastic that he's been doing that and it's so funny and i don't know if you're in uh this world as well as far as the uh the the sideshow uh, uh and I'm for hot toy kind of size mm -hmm. versus migo but apparently with the heart with the hardcore people there is like kind of a I wouldn't call it a rivalry, but they kind of look, you know, they're they're not they're not friendly about Mego versus Captain really? Action figures, which cracks me up. I mean, Ed's cool and Ed loves art, but he's like, Yeah, you're a decent guy for being a Mego guy. And it's just like that's amazing. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. That's I mean, I'll tell you, you you some of the like uh for example, this company NECA put out movie accurate teenage mutant ninja turtle figures from like the original movie. Yep. And I mean they're incredible. They were very hard to get because of licensing stuff. They could only limit, you know, limited runs on stuff. Right, right. And the amount of grown men you would see just showing their whole ass on the internet over a plastic rat was absurd. <laughs> I could, I was like, I'll never be like that. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I think, I think the the sort of intercompany beef thing would, I would probably just be like, Nah, man, I'm glad you like toys. You know, I bought a. <laughs> it hasn't come yet, but I bought uh, before they started making it a Brent from the Planet of the Apes movies, from Beneath the Planet of the Apes, the James Franciscus lead actor from the second movie. Okay. Uh, because I'm a I'm a I'm an astronaut freak and I love astronaut stuff. I've yet to find uh a major Matt Mason that I can afford from Mattel from back oh, in the sure. day. Yeah. Because then I I mean uh, those are my little kid toys. I yeah I mean I like the G.I. Joe's those were great but to me I mean, it was, you know, I was four years old when the moon landing happened. So, and I, my parents were very smart to go, this is what's happening right now. And I got it. Yeah. So I'm like, you know, I was a total Ap Apollo kid. So anything related to that, Major Matt Mason was my guy. Yeah. Comics, coffee, and metal wants to know any high crimes or other figures from your other creator owned projects. Will you make a Jaeger? Will you make a retroactive uh, Lee guy? Or, you know, uh, uh, I, that's a great question. I actually do plan to try to make uh, a couple characters from Count because, great. yeah, I just think that you know, toy. That there's a, there's a saying in in um, toys uh, when something is toyetic. Yes, of right? course, I learned that yeah. phrase. Yes, toyetic. Yeah. And so I I feel like Count is very toyetic, and so I want to I want to try to kit bash a couple things and see if I can come up with something. I think that sounds great, man. Dude, hilarious in the in the best way. You know, I like it with you. That's that's great, and it also gave me a chance to do my William Daniels and my Michael Caine. Yeah, I'm doing Michael Caines. So uh, <laughs> no, I mean, that, I, man, that that William Daniels. I, I gotta tell you, because when I was blown up on the screen, and so I didn't see you do it, and I was like, wait, what? Does well, yeah, if you <laughs> if you have a way of putting any sort of audio sensor in kit. And I might do that. Go, I might look up. I'm sure there's a way to do that, Michael. You know, yeah. Just... <laughs> yeah. No, I'm I'm sure there's a way to do it, and I'll be giving you a call. <laughs> he was in um St. Elsewhere and was mm -hmm. incredibly funny in St. Elsewhere before uh Knight Rider. And um he was just this smart ass know-it-all surgeon that was in charge of all the interns. Denzel was one of the young doctors back That's then, right. so yeah. was um uh Howie Mandel. And uh, and Ed Begley Jr. and stuff. It, it, St. Elsewhere's hilarious show. And I William know Dennis him. One of the best things about it. I know him as Mr. Feeney from Boy Meets World. Yes, he indeed. The, yeah, he was the neighbor and teacher, and then principal, I think. And so, yeah, that. But I I I watched Night Rider as a little kid, and then so, you know, finding sure. like, wait, that's the guy. I've I, been uh, I've been rewatching Night Rider as I as I work on this. Man, I had never seen the pilot. Yeah. And I know it's not, I know it's streaming on, or it was streaming on Netflix. It's on recently. Netflix. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, I'm like, you know, I really want to see it because I was really curious who the original Michael Knight, you know, you know who played him. And, you know, Richard Basart from uh, Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, the old Admiral, okay. is, uh, is the original Michael Knight before he passes away and gives the name and everything to, uh, to, to the Hoth. And, uh, yeah, it's great. And also Edward Mulhair, the, uh, the guy, the spy master on uh, Knight Rider and everything. I forget his character's name. He's, he's very, uh, Michael 
Kane like as well. Like oh, if yeah. they were to make like a movie adaptation, like Michael Kane would be the guy, you know. That's Which, awesome. yeah. You know, I, I I had them uh, redesign Kit to do uh, some various things. I think you need to do Michael. He's got a speedometer the size of a tangerine. <laughs> <laughs> the thing about uh, <laughs> that show that's so funny is like Michael Knight is a like so David Hasselhoff's character is a cop who is not David Hasselhoff. And then he's involved in this thing that happens. And then Michael Knight, the original one, the old guy, like saves him basically, like whisks him away to some secret like hospital, gives him a new face and a new name. And it's like, you didn't have to do all that. Like, I I don't understand for the story <laughs> purposes, like why they you had to do all that. Yeah. Like he could have just been like a guy. And then Michael Knight said, like, I'm going to give you an ID and, you know, the whole him being a cop and then the facial reconstruction thing was just like it was pointless and doesn't ever come up again you know that's true so, also the 80s, uh, man well exactly because you know remo williams just the same kind of thing yeah you know and i love i love the remo williams movie so i will say though <laughs> night rider's a ton of fun to watch uh <laughs> nowadays and it's just like a just a like every episode is like a different eighties babe. And it's awesome. Yes. hundred <laughs> yeah. percent. Oh my dude. Those were the days. I mean, yes. I... <laughs> <laughs> and they're mostly new to me. There are a few that I've like, Oh yeah, I remember her from such and such, but like, it's always just like a, like a new well, beautiful face. I've never seen Morgan before. Fairchild and Marky post weren't available every week. So right. they're like <laughs> dealing with these other, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's super fun. And like the, you know, you can see a guy dressed as like a the car seat, like driving the car. You know, it's it's awesome. <laughs> I might put I might put him in the, uh, in the small that, version. That's why I meant. No, those Glenn. I think it was a Glenn Larson show. Those shows were just fantastic. All those all those eighties like stupid shows like that. I mean, good lord, you're killing me. That's yeah. fantastic. So, all right, Deep. Uh, excellent as always. Hey, truly great. Thanks for having uh, me, man. Always good to catch up with you. Hundred percent, man. So retroactive coming out in a couple weeks uh, from humanoids. Please be on the lookout for that. Also his, I don't have the cover up, but uh, Dr. Strange one shot. Uh, and who wrote that again? Uh, Ralph Macchio. And it's called Dr. Strange and the Nexus of Nightmares. Perfect. Outstanding. And then uh, pick, up, pick up count. Yes. Thank you. If you go to my website, Ibrahim Mustafa.com, there's links to, you know, purchase count and retroactive. There's trailers. There's, all my social media stuff at the bottom. If you want to see the stuff on YouTube, we were talking about, there's a YouTube button there. So yeah. Ibrahim Mustafa.com. There you go, everybody hang out for a second. As uh, I wrap things up, even we'll, uh, we'll talk, but uh, as and thanks always, everyone in the chat, by the way, for, for hanging out with us. Oh, there you go. Oh, that's really nice. Super, super Brad, uh, uh, Bradley Torres. I've got a new fan and subscriber. Very charismatic. Oh, that's nice. Respectful and knowledgeable. Great impersonation. You get the whole package on Word Balloon. What can I say? Let me tell you, Brad is one of the best guys you'll ever meet. And uh, he uh, hopefully you'll get to meet him at a convention. Uh, Yeah, wonderful guy. That would be amazing. And I again, I appreciate every uh, person that likes and subscribes to the video. I love everyone who does the audio as well. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching, everybody. Um, I'm uh, I'm doing some catch up. You'll forgive me. But the, the Hall of Fame thing, I actually had to do some prep. So I didn't look like a schmuck when I was getting the award. <laughs> so I'm a little behind, but uh, it's still going to be a great month here on Word Balloons. So stay with us. Until next time, stay safe, stay happy, stay healthy.